Hi, all. Welcome back to TED Climate, a podcast from the TED Audio Collective. It's me, your host, Dan Cortler, and today we're going to be talking about one of the greatest marvels of the planet and my personal favorite living things, other than humans and my cat, I guess. It's trees! You've probably heard people talk about planting a trillion more trees in order to combat the climate crisis. And the thinking behind this is that in addition to steeply reducing our fossil fuel emissions, we're also going to need to pull out excess carbon dioxide from the air. Scientists have been investigating some ways to do this in the lab, but trees, these guys have been on the job for like a zillion years. However, we're going to need a lot more trees to match the scale at which we're pumping out carbon. To give you a sense, the largest known living tree on the planet is a sequoia named General Sherman. A very dapper name, I know. The old general is a whopping 84 meters tall, and it's sequestered roughly 1,400 tons of atmospheric carbon over its estimated 2,500 years on the planet. Very few trees can compete with this carbon impact. But today, humanity produces more than that amount of carbon every minute. So, with such daunting numbers, how exactly can trees help in our fight against climate change? And how do they sequester carbon in the first place? Like all plants, trees consume atmospheric carbon through a chemical reaction called photosynthesis. That's right, y'all, we're doing some sixth grade science today. This process uses energy from sunlight to convert water and carbon dioxide into oxygen and energy storing carbohydrates. Plants then consume these carbohydrates in a reverse process called respiration. This means they convert the carbohydrates to energy and release carbon back into the atmosphere. In trees, however, a large portion of that carbon isn't released. Instead, it's stored as wood. During their lifetimes, trees act as carbon vaults, and they continue to draw down carbon for as long as they grow. When a tree dies and decays, yeah, some of its carbon does get released back into the air, but even then, a significant amount of CO2 is stored deep in the soil, where it can remain for thousands of years. So if trees are going to help fight a long-term problem like climate change, they need to survive to sequester their carbon for the longest period possible while also reproducing quickly. So is there one type of tree we could plant that meets all these criteria? Some fast-growing, long-lived, super-sequestering species that we could scatter worldwide? No, not, not that we know of. But even if such a tree existed, it actually wouldn't be a good long-term solution. Forests are complex networks of living organisms, and there's no one species that can thrive in every ecosystem. The most sustainable trees to plant are always native ones, species that already play a role in their local environment. Research suggests that ecosystems with a naturally occurring diversity of trees just do better. They have less competition for resources, they better resist climate change. This means we shouldn't just plant trees to draw down carbon. We need to be restoring ecosystems that we've clear-cut and developed. So, just how many regions could be transformed back into lush, green, carbon-sequestering forests? Well, in 2019, a study led by Zurich's Crowther Lab tried to answer just this question by analyzing satellite imagery of the world's existing tree cover. By combining it with climate and soil data and excluding the areas necessary for human use, they determined that Earth could support nearly 1 billion hectares of additional forest. That comes out to roughly 1.2 trillion trees. This staggering number surprised the scientific community, who then dug deeper to find a more conservative, but still very significant figure. By their revised estimates, these restored ecosystems could capture anywhere from 100 to 200 billion tons of carbon. That accounts for over one-sixth of humanity's carbon emissions. And more than half of the potential forest canopy for these restoration efforts can be found in just six countries. But this is where it gets complicated. Ecosystems are incredibly complex, and it's honestly unclear whether they're best restored by human intervention at all. It's possible that the right thing to do for certain areas is just to leave them alone. Additionally, some researchers worry that restoring forests on this scale could have unintended consequences, like producing natural biochemicals at a pace that could actually accelerate climate change. Plus, even if we succeed in restoring these areas, future generations will need to protect them from the natural and economic forces that previously depleted them. 
Taken together, these challenges have made a lot of folks less confident in large-scale restoration projects. And the complexity of rebuilding ecosystems shows how important it is to protect existing forests. But hopefully, restoring some of these depleted regions will give us the data and conviction necessary to combat climate change on a larger scale. And if we get it right, who knows? Maybe these modern trees will have time to grow into carbon-carrying titans. All right, so there's a lot more to restoring our ecosystems than just planting trees. And there's actually a lot more to solving climate change than just restoration. That study that I mentioned from the Crowther Lab, well, Thomas Crowther actually gave a TED Talk on how restoration isn't a silver bullet solution. So definitely check that out on TED.com. But trees are a silver bullet solution to my heart. I wasn't kidding when I was saying these are my favorite living things. Seriously, one of my go-to activities here in New York City is to prune the city's trees to help keep them healthy. And by the way, if you're interested in this sort of thing, do check out if they have some kind of tree stewardship program where you live. Trees need your help. I only mention all this because urban trees are scientifically proven to be vital for a healthy city. It's not just that they make the city way prettier, which they do. There are huge benefits to a tree-filled metropolis. We may think of nature as being unconnected to our urban spaces, but trees have always been an essential part of successful cities. They act like a natural sponge, absorbing stormwater runoff before releasing it back into the atmosphere. The webs of their roots protect against mudslides while allowing soil to retain water and filter out toxins. The roots also help prevent floods while reducing the need for storm drains and water treatment plants. Plus, their porous leaves purify the air by trapping carbon and other pollutants. Urban planners and city dwellers have been uncovering these arboreal benefits for centuries. But trees aren't just crucial to the health of a city's infrastructure. They play a vital role in the health of its citizens as well. In the 1870s, Manhattan had few trees outside the island's parks. And without trees to provide shade, buildings absorbed up to nine times more solar radiation during deadly summer heat waves. That is hot. Combined with the period's poor sanitation standards, the oppressive heat made the city a breeding ground for bacteria like cholera. And in modern-day Hong Kong, tall skyscrapers and underground infrastructure make it difficult for trees to grow at all. This contributes to the city's dangerously poor air quality, which can cause bronchitis and diminished lung function. Trees also affect our mental health. Research indicates that the presence of green foliage increases attention spans and decreases stress levels. It's even been shown that hospital patients with views of brick walls recover more slowly than those with views of trees. Fortunately, many cities have figured all this out and incorporated trees into their urban planning, bringing with them a plethora of environmental benefits. For example, after World War II, Copenhagen directed all new development along five arteries, each sandwiched between a lovely park. This layout increased the city's resilience to pollution and natural disasters. And urban trees don't just benefit people. Portland's Forest Park preserves the region's natural biodiversity, making the city home to various local plants, birds, and mammals. Oh, and we have got to talk about Singapore, y'all. Since 1967, the government there has planted over 1.2 million trees, including those within 50-meter-tall vertical gardens called super trees. Seriously, please Google super trees. They're amazing. These structures sustain themselves and nearby conservatories with solar energy and collected rainwater. Trees and vegetation currently cover over 50% of Singapore's landmass, reducing the need for air conditioning during the summer and encouraging low pollution transportation. By 2050, it's estimated that over 65% of the world is gonna be living in cities. City planners can lay an eco-friendly foundation, but it's up to us to make these spaces home for more than just humans. Aren't trees great? I hope you are also feeling the love for these magnificent beings after this episode. Honestly, we have barely scratched the bark <laughs> on how truly incredible these trees are. Don't scratch the bark of trees. This is bad. Leave them as is. But, but seriously, I mean, just looking at a tree can make you feel happier. That's not me. That's science. They're, they're, they're big and they're beautiful and they got branches. All right, I'm going to stop gushing now, but 
If you do want to dig more into their hidden beauty and find out how all trees are talking to each other all the time, do check out the TED Ed lesson, The Secret Language of Trees by Camille Dufresne and Suzanne Samard. It'll blow your mind. And then go plant a tree or help a tree or consider supporting organizations that are working on reforestation and restoration. Anyways, thanks for tuning in. Come back next week for more on how we can change climate change. You can also get involved by joining Countdown, TED's global initiative to accelerate solutions to the climate crisis in collaboration with future stewards. Find out more at countdown.ted.com. TED Climate is produced and edited by Sheena Ozaki, mixed by Sam Baer, and hosted by me, Dan Cortler. This episode adapted two lessons originally produced in animated form by the TED-Ed team. What If There Were One Trillion More Trees was written by Jean-Francois Bassin, and What Happens If You Cut Down All the City's Trees was written by Stefan Alp. Both pieces were produced with editorial support from Alex Gendler and myself, and fact-checked by Ed Germa. Special thanks to Alex Rosenthal, Gerta Jello, Michelle Quint, Ben Ben Chang, and Anna Phelan.